Second Thessalonians chapter number 2. That's page 1271 in your school for your Bible. And then I want you to turn also to Revelation 13, verse number 1. And that's page 1341 in your school for your Revelation 13 and Second Thessalonians chapter number 2. Now I began three Sunday nights ago now. This is the third Sunday night in the series. A series of messages that I'm calling 13 Steps to Armageddon. Now, that's the general theme of all the uh, sermons. They'll all be on the second coming, uh, some particular aspect of the second coming. And I'm sure that the subject is too big uh, to get all that could be said about the second coming of our Lord in 13 sermons. For example, I have not dealt with the signs at all, except to mention the dilemma uh, of the day in the first sermon that I brought two Sunday nights ago. And I don't know that I have time to deal with the signs in this series. Maybe we'll do that later. But I do want to deal with tonight. Last Sunday night, I dealt with the rapture and the tribulation from Revelation 4 and 5 and 6. And now tonight, I want to deal uh, with the Antichrist and the mark of the beast. The Antichrist and the mark of the beast in relation to the general theme of Armageddon. 13 steps to Armageddon. And that will be the consummation of all uh, the, the doctrine of the second coming of our Lord uh, when he comes in power and great glory at Armageddon to destroy the armies of the world gathered against Jerusalem in that day in the valley of Megiddo. And we're marching rapidly so far as I'm able to discern to that all-important crisis moment that we call Armageddon and what the Bible calls, in fact, uh, Armageddon, the battle of Armageddon. And so we are moving forward toward that now, not only in secular history, but in Bible prophecy, we're moving rapidly to that point of no return, Armageddon. We'll be dealing with that battle in the last sermon of the series. Now, after the rapture takes place, and we saw the rapture set forth in glorious symbolism in Revelation 4. After these things, John said, I looked and behold, a, a door was open in heaven. And I saw the throne and him that sat upon the throne, and he described the Sardine stone, the jasper stone, and the emerald stone uh, in that first glimpse inside the uh, uh, gate when the door was open in heaven. And they also described the rainbow around about the throne, and he that sat upon that throne. I tried to show you what all that is in symbolism, uh, in typology, Bible typology. And then in chapter number 5, uh, a scene in heaven, uh, as they found he that's worthy to take the book, seven seal book and commenced to loose the seven seals of the book. And the Lamb was worthy, and the Lamb took the book, and began to break the seven seals of the book in chapter number 5 of the Revelation. Then in chapter 6, the first seal is open, and behold, uh, he said, Come and see, and there was a rider upon the white horse. And that rider upon the white horse, as the first seal is broken, is none other than the personal Antichrist, the man of sin, about whom I'm going to try to preach tonight. Now, the rider upon the white horse is identical with the rider upon the red horse that follows with the breaking of the second seal, and identical with the rider upon the uh, black horse that follows with the breaking of the third seal, and identical with the rider upon the pale horse, the horse of death, uh, in the breaking of seal number four. The Antichrist, that's the man of sin, the satanic incarnated personality. Now, I want you, if you can now, to draw your mind away from everything in the world, and let's center our mind tonight upon the scriptures that we might be able to see some things about uh, this personality, this individual who is classified and called in the scriptures that are about to read the son of perdition. And then in the first epistle of John, he's called the Antichrist. And then in my scripture that I'm about to read in Second Thessalonians, he's called the son of uh, a perdition. And I mentioned that a moment ago. The wicked one he's also called, and he's called the deceiver. The Antichrist is him. Now, the Antichrist is not uh, just a system or an idea, but a personality. He's going to be a satanic-inspired personality, a satanic-controlled individual, the man of sin. Now, that's the terminology I was trying to think of instead of the terminology of son of perdition. He is to be the man of sin. An individual called the man of sin, the lawless one. He's also identified and called by uh, that uh, terminology as well. 
of the Antichrist, the personal Antichrist. Now, you might wonder why would there be the necessity of such an individual. Well, this uh, is the crowning work of the devil. This is the crowning work of the mystery of iniquity that doth already work. And the mystery of iniquity is God's way of referring to the program of the devil from the time the devil uh, conceived in his wicked heart that he would overthrow God and sit on God's throne until the devil is sown into the lake of fire, cast into the lake of fire, where the beast and the false prophet are, you see. And then you have the satanic trinity, by the way, in Revelation chapter number 20, when the devil is cast into the lake of fire, because the first two cast into the lake of fire will be the Antichrist and the false prophet. And then Satan is to be cast in with them, where the beast and the false prophet are, and have been for a thousand years, when the devil himself is cast into the lake of fire at the close of the millennial age, the reign of Christ for a thousand years upon the earth. Now this man of sin is to be a Satan's representative, Satan's counterfeit Messiah. And for all practical purposes, that's exactly what he's going to be, a counterfeit Savior. Now the world is looking today for a superman. Uh, do you think it's a coincidence that you have so many references in the newspaper and even out of Hollywood and on the TV and in the printed page about a superman? I don't think that's an action at all. I think the people of the world are being brainwashed to expect the appearing of a superman. On the TV screen, they advertise a, a superman with super strength and super ability. The time is going to come, whether they are aware of it or not, and I don't think they are. But the time is going to come when that superman indeed is going to appear. Now we know the superman of the Bible as the man of sin, the Antichrist, the son of perdition. And he's going to appear at the appointed hour, at the right time, at the fullness of time. Uh, his coming is after all the cunning devices of the devil, as I'll read to you in just one moment. But I'm trying to lay uh, something of a foundation for the scripture that I'm about to read in Second Thessalonians and chapter number 2. Now that man of sin cannot appear until the time is right. Uh, we're told that there must be a falling away first. And then shall that wicked one be revealed. In other words, I'm saying to you that the man of sin cannot come on the scene until general apostasy grips the world of religion. And general apostasy cannot get full control of the world of religion until the salt and the light is raptured out. So I'm, I'm prepared to say to you that the man of sin cannot be revealed until the church is caught out of the earth. Now, I think the rapture out or the lifting out of the church and the revelation of the Antichrist will be almost simultaneous as far as time is concerned. I, I, I'd rather think that the church is raptured out first. How long first, I do not know. Whether one day or one week or one month, I do not know. Nobody knows when the Lord is coming again. But sometimes after the church is raptured out, then shall that wicked one appear. Now, that's the Antichrist. And he cannot appear until the church is lifted out because he who now led it or hinders the blessed Holy Spirit, uh, Paul has in mind when he says that, uh, it will stay in the earth and remain in the earth as a hindering factor to the devil in relation to the Antichrist until the church is raptured out and then the Holy Ghost leaves the world with the church. And then the stage is right and ready for the revelation and the appearance of the superman called uh, the Antichrist. Now with those words in mind, let's look at the Bible and tie some ends together as we find it in Second Thessalonians and chapter number 2. Now we beseech you, brethren, all writing to the church at Thessalonica, to the born-again brethren, uh, like you and I are in 1979, I beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and at his coming, our gathering together unto him, which was Paul's way of talking about the rapture. Because when Jesus comes, that's when we're to be gathered together unto him. And that's logical as it can be, and reasonable as it can be. Uh, the dead have to be resurrected. They are to be gathered together unto him. The living have to be changed and transmigrated. They are to be gathered together with the resurrected dead 
unto him, you see. And so Paul beseeches the brethren by, in regards to the second coming of our Lord, and at the second coming, our gathering together unto him. And that's the big thing that's going to happen at the rapture phase of the second coming of our Lord. He comes as a thief of the night with the sound of the trumpet. And the moment that trumpet sounds, the dead get up. As sure as you hear me, the dead get up. And we that are alive and remain, who are not dead but alive and remain, are to be changed in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. And we together will rise with him, gathered together unto him. Now that's the rapture of our Lord. Now Paul said, I beseech you that you be not shaken uh, in mind or trouble, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letters as for me, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Now most of the uh, Bible expositors think that in verse number 2, Paul suggests the possibility that some folk in his day uh, were preaching that Christ had already come, had already returned. And that there would not be a future second coming of our Lord. Uh, whether you're aware of it or not, uh, there's some denominations in our day uh, who believe that. That you remember uh, the Jehovah Witness for a long time uh, taught and preached that Jesus came back in 1914. And other false ideas have been set forth forward in relation to the second coming of our Lord. Now, evident in Paul's day, some were teaching that Christ was not coming again. The liberals and the modernists in the Baptist world, do not believe what I'm preaching. Why they say the second coming of our Lord is when a saint dies, and at death, that's the second coming. Or they say the second coming of Jesus is when a sinner becomes converted. Or they say the second coming of Jesus is when we preach the gospel, and the gospel falls upon responding ears. That's the second coming. No, no, that's not. Uh, the Bible demands a personal, visible, literal return of Jesus in Acts 1 and verse number 11. And nothing short of that will fulfill Bible prophecy. The second coming could not be the descent of the Holy Spirit. And you'd be surprised how many Baptists believe that the second coming was fulfilled in Acts chapter 2 when the Holy Spirit came down from God out of heaven. No. Now, the Holy Spirit is one person. The Holy Son is a different person. And I submit to you that the second coming of our Lord requires the personal, visible, physical return of Jesus Christ back to this earth the second time. And nothing short of that will satisfy the scripture. Now, if they were teaching in Paul's day at the church of Thessalonica, that already uh, the second coming had transpired, they were wrong. And Paul is trying to set the record straight in verse number two. Now, in verse three, he said, let no man deceive you uh, by any means. Uh, for that day shall not come except. Now that's the whole point of potential uh, deception in verse 3, the second coming, that day of the Lord. That's the whole point of contention, and that's the whole point of deception, that Christ had already come. Paul said, no, that's not right. He has not returned, and he exhorts the Thessalonians, let no man deceive you by any means, uh, by, uh, by spirit, or by word, or by a forged a letter from me. If anybody brings a letter to you with my name on it, and in that letter I declare, or somebody else declares, Jesus has come again, he said, don't you believe it. Let no man deceive you by any means. Uh, for that day, the second coming, for that day of the Lord, when he comes again, shall not come except there come a falling away first. Now that's the apostasy. And second, except the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. In other words, when the Lord comes again, the Antichrist must be ready and must appear simultaneously. And Paul is saying the very fact that there is no Antichrist is all the evidence you ought to need to convince you that the Lord has not returned. Now, after the rapture takes place, the Antichrist will appear soon and immediately. And you know for sure that the Lord has returned because you've got the Antichrist on your hand, you see. But you didn't have the Antichrist in the days of the Thessalonian church. And Paul is saying, I let no man deceive you by any means. Because there are two things that must transpire at the second coming of our Lord. 
Number one, there must be an apostasy, a falling away. Now, uh, the word apostasy is always used in the New Testament in relation to religious uh, uh, apostasy. It has a religious connotation and not a physical connotation. If you have the idea that the falling away uh, in verse number three uh, uh, refers to the rapture when we fall away from the earth, so to speak, and rise to meet Jesus in the cloud, then you're wrong. Because the word apostasy is never used in that light. It's always used in relation to religion. And so Paul is saying there must come a falling away first, a falling away from the faith, a falling away from the Bible, a falling away from the doctrine of the second coming, a falling away from other doctrines in the Bible as well. That general falling away, that general apostasy must and will precede the second coming of our Lord. Now, I, I'd like to submit to you that we now live in that day. I don't think you could explain the religious uh, climate and the religious situation in our day any other way except by the term and the reality apostasy. We have more religion today probably than we've ever had, and yet fewer born-again individuals. We have a great deal of religious activity out there, activity in our day, but multitudes of that, much of that, has departed from the precepts of this book. And you could not equate a great deal of religion in our day with the truth of God's word. I think we live now in the day of the apostasy. I believe the day of the apostasy, as we now know it, is going to become increasingly worse. I think it'll gradually mount up until the man of sin appears, who will be the climax of the apostasy. In fact, he's called the apostate. He's going to be the crowning work of all the devil's mystery of iniquity. But already the apostasy uh, is upon us. Now, I can give you a little spin illustration of that. Uh, one illustration uh, is the departing from the assembly of the church as the matter of some is. Now, in our city, there are scores upon scores of churches that are not having services tonight. And they did not have services last Sunday night. And they'll not have a service Wednesday night. Now, they'll have something of a service next Sunday morning, but one time a week, and that's it. No Wednesday night, no revivals, I mean, never. I cannot recall in my life ever a revival in Christ the Episcopal Church in our city. And I've been here a long time. And I would have slipped on it, I think, or read about it, or heard about it. They don't have revivals. And I think I can recall a few advertised revivals in Buffalo Street Methodist for just a handful. And I seldom ever anymore hear a revival at the First Methodist Church in our city. I mean, they just don't have revivals. And you'd be surprised how many churches are in that category tonight, are falling away. Uh, they can't get enough folk together on Sunday night to have a preaching service. And they consequently call it all off, and on Sunday morning they go through a form of godliness and dismiss, and we'll see you next Sunday morning. That's it. Now that's a form of godliness, and that's the fruit of apostasy that be upon us now. And that's going to become worse and worse. And the churches that are closing their doors all over this land because of apostasy. You drive through the north in Pennsylvania and Ohio and Indiana, and you see one-room church buildings all along the countryside that are, that are vacated and deserted and abandoned. I mean, quite frequently you see them on the side of the road, and sometimes in the south, but not a great deal in the south. But in the north you see a great deal of that. You go to Scotland tonight, and I was dumbfounded when I was there uh, two years ago. My wife and I had to see nice church buildings with high steeple and stained windows, boarded up, closed up, abandoned, and deserted. Some of them being used for furniture factories, others being used for warehouses, right in the city of Edinburgh, Scotland. Right in the city limits of Edinburgh, Scotland. I guess I saw a dozen such churches described. 
I went into the, uh, in, we went in, the tour group went into the church where John Knox, uh, preached, uh, uh, when he, when he lived back in the days of the Protestant Reformation. And they were having a service while we were there. And this is a Presbyterian church. And there was a Presbyterian preacher in the elevated pulpit preaching. And there was a total number of four people in the view. Four people. And that church would seat 2,000 if it seat one. And there was two people, uh, four people in the pew that day while that preacher stood there and preached. And he, he was preaching. I imagine he was preaching. I, I didn't tear along, but I would imagine he was preaching. He had his Bible. He was either preaching or reading some kind of a service one or the other. Had his robe on, all the paraphernalia of a priest of the Presbyterian group, and four people that stood there and preached. Now that's a tragedy. That's a sad tragedy. Now we're living uh, in that kind of apostate condition, and it's going to become worse. Now Paul said, don't let anybody deceive you. Uh, the second coming will not be a reality until the apostasy comes. Now I'm aware of the fact that some who teach the second coming believe that that apostasy is a reference to the rapture, but I don't accept that. I think it's religious apostasy and not a physical falling away. And then the second thing that must transpire is the appearance of the son of man, of the son of perdition, the Antichrist. And as long as there is no Antichrist in the world, Jesus has not returned. So you, you can may, measure it by that fact. If you ever hear a man say, already the Lord has returned, then tell him to point out who the Antichrist is. Because if the Lord has returned, the Antichrist is on hand. And if he's not on hand, then according to that verse, the Lord has not returned. So don't let the man deceive you, for that day shall not come except the apostasy first. And second, the man of sin be revealed, uh, who is the son of perdition. Now about this man of sin, let's look at verse number four. About the man of sin, this is the Antichrist now. The Bible says that he opposes God, that he exalted himself above all that's called God, that is above all the gods of the earth. Not only Jehovah, but he exalts himself above Buddha and above all other gods, Muhammad included. He exalts himself above all that's called God, not only my God, but he exalts himself above the pagan, heathen gods of the world as well. That's the nature of the Antichrist. He exalts himself also above all that is worshipped. If there's any person worshipped in the world, the Antichrist says, I'm greater than he. I'm more important than he. He exalts himself above all that's worshipped as well. So, in this exaltation, he uh, is as God in his own mind. And in the minds of his followers, he is as God sitting in the temple of God that's the rebuilt temple in Jerusalem. Showing himself uh, to those that are left behind after the rapture. Showing himself that he is God. Claiming to be God. And demanding that he be worshipped as God. On the part of those that are left behind after the rapture takes place. Now may I remind you again that you and I that are saved will not be on hand when the Antichrist appears. And don't you, don't you buy uh, this idea that the rapture takes place after the tribulation? No, sir. Or at the middle of the tribulation? No, sir. The rapture takes place before the tribulation period begins. And this verse is all the text you need to show you that, you see. And so here's the Antichrist with his highly exalted, egotistic spirit. He deifies himself. He opposes God. And he exalts himself above all the God that men worship around the world. And he sits in the temple in Jerusalem. The new Solomon's temple in Jerusalem. And when the Jews come in, he claims to be God. And I'll show you that next Sunday night with the message on the abomination of desolation. But that's what he's going to do. Now in verse 5, Paul goes on to say, Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. Now, if ever there was a pastor, a missionary, a Bible preacher, 
who preached the second coming, it was Paul. And he said to the Thessalonians, I now write these things to you, but don't you remember when I was with you? I went over these things with you time and time again. I taught you these things. I preached these things to you. I instructed you in relation to these things. Now I write them to you, but I've already been over them with you when I was with you. I think every pastor, every evangelist, every Bible teacher ought to teach and preach the second coming of our Lord. Now I, I question whether God wants me uh, to deal with that exclusively. Out at the Bob Jones University radio station at 6 o'clock every morning, you have what they call the Southwest Radio Church. And all they deal with on that program, this is not critical now, but all they deal with on that program is second coming. I mean prophecy, every day, prophecy, prophecy. Well, I have no objections to that. If God calls a man to do that, but I would not recommend that because the pastor has to preach a lot of other things. But at the same time, somewhere in the course of his preaching, like Paul in verse number five, you must go over the doctrine of the second coming and teach the doctrine of the second coming to your people. Paul did, and I must do the same thing by the grace of God. And now ye know what was it that he might reveal in his time. Now he's talking about the revelation of the Antichrist. At God's time, he's going to be revealed, but he said, uh, I want you to know what withhold it. Now what is the withhold in factor? What is the thing that holds the devil back from bringing the Antichrist prematurely on the stage of action? Well, we'll see uh, in just a moment. In verse 7, for the mystery of iniquity. Now this is a Bible term for the devil's entire program. And the climax of the devil's entire program is the appearing of the man of sin, the Antichrist. For the mystery of iniquity is already working. It started working in the mind of the devil before he was cast out of heaven. And it's still working. Only he who now led it will let it. Now, here's a classic illustration of an old English word that we don't now use in the way it's used in verse number 7. And this is not a critical word about our Bible. I believe in the King James Bible. I use only the King James Bible. And don't you dare go out of here and say the preacher criticize the King James Bible. If you do, you're narrow-minded and you're ignorant. You know what you're talking about. I was preaching the King James Bible for some of you born. Now the word let it literally means hinder. Hinder. Now nowadays we would not say let. We would say hinder. If you go over to England today, in America and you have an apartment for rent, uh, you put a sign for rent. But over in England they say uh, rooms to let. Rooms to let. Now they mean by that that uh, you can rent it. But they, we don't use that word let in that fashion anymore. Now the word let in the King James in this verse means he who now hinders the program of the mystery of iniquity will continue to hinder that program until he be taken out of the way. Now the singular masculine pronoun he who now hinders is a reference to the Holy Spirit. God's executive in the world tonight is the Holy Spirit. And he's the one that holds the devil back. He's the one that restrains the Antichrist from a premature appearing. And the Antichrist cannot appear until the Holy Ghost is taken out of the earth. And the Holy Spirit is removed from the earth when the church is raptured out of the same blood of our Lord. And when he leaves the world with the church, then the devil's got a free hand to bring the Antichrist on the scene. And that's when he's coming on the scene. Only he will now let it will continue to let until he be taken out of the way. He who now hinders will continue to hinder until he be taken out of the way. And then, verse 8, watch this now. Verse 8 is related to verse number 7. You notice, uh, you notice a comma at the end of verse 7, not a period. Verse number 8 is a continuation of the same thought. And then, when the Holy Ghost is taken out, when the church is raptured out, then shall that wicked one Note the capital W. The wicked one is the Antichrist. 
The wicked one is the son of perdition. The wicked one is the man of sin. The wicked one is the beast out of the, out of the earth, out of the sea in Revelation 13. The wicked one is the little horn of Daniel 9. Then shall that wicked one, but not until then, that wicked one cannot appear until the Holy Spirit is taken out of the earth. And then shall that wicked one be revealed. Now about his revelation we're told in verse 8, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy at the battle of Armageddon with the brightness of his coming. And that's exactly what's going to happen. At the battle of Armageddon, the beast and the false prophet are taken. When Jesus destroys the armies by the brightness of his appearing, the very same terminology is used in Revelation 19. And Paul wrote this in verse number 8, and John wrote that in Revelation 19, and yet they use the same terminology. And so the Antichrist is destroyed by the brightness of his appearing at the battle of Armageddon. And along with the Antichrist is cast into the lake of fire. The very first two cast alive into the lake of fire will be the Antichrist of the false prophet. Then shall that wicked one be revealed. And after seven years of his ministry upon the earth, the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth that sharp two-edged sword John talks about coming out of his mouth. And shall destroy with the brightness of his appearance. If you were to slip over to Revelation 19 and see the similarity in the terminology. Verse 8 means exactly that. That's battle of Armageddon. When the Antichrist is to be destroyed and cast into the lake of power. Even him, the Antichrist, whose coming is after the working of Satan. The crowning work of the working of Satan. The masterpiece of the mystery of iniquity with all power, and with signs, and with lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish. Now watch how the devil brings this man on the scene. He does so with power, he does so with signs, he does so with lying wonders, and he does so with deceivableness of unrighteousness. Now we're going to read in just a moment, if I get time to get to it, in Revelation 13 about some of these signs that are done in the sight of the beast by the false prophet. Lying wonders they are to, to deceive even the elect of God and the elect of God of the tribulation is Israel. But they are so masterful until even the elect Israel is apt to be deceived by some of the lying wonders of the Antichrist in the time of the tribulation period. Now, uh, in verse number 11, here's a tremendous text. For this cause, God shall send them, that is the world of lost people, in the tribulation, a strong delusion. And that strong delusion that God's going to send to people enables them to believe the lie that the Antichrist is really the Messiah. And you could, you could imagine how people could be so grossly deceived without that strong delusion. There'd be no way. But in the tribulation period, God is going to send them strong delusion. And the people of the world will actually believe that the Antichrist is the real God and the real Savior and the real Messiah that the world is looking for. And they're going to believe that because God sends them strong delusion that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but who have pleasure in unrighteousness. Now turn to Revelation 13. Just lift your Bible there for a moment, and I don't have but about ten more minutes to go. Then I, I, after that ten minutes, I think I'll be ready uh, to, to wind it down. Now here is another picture by John, the beloved disciple, in Revelation 13, of the same man Paul describes in Second Thessalonians 2. John said in verse 1, I stood among the sands of the sea, and the sea in Bible terminology and revelation is a picture of the human family. All the mass of the human family. Have you ever heard anybody say, I see, I look upon a sea of faces. Right now I could say, I'm looking upon a sea of faces. Well, I don't mean a water sea, I mean a lot of people. And so the word sea is a picture of the whole human family. Now he said, I stood upon the sands of the human family. And as I did, I saw a beast. 
rise up out of the sea, out of the human family, having seven heads and ten horns. No, oh, I would I had time to expound that. But if I get into that, I'll not be able to get to the mark of the beast. And I wanted to mention that tonight. Maybe I'll come back to the seven heads and ten horns later. I saw no longer than last week a whole page in a newspaper concerning the European common market and the fact that there are now nine nations involved and they are hoping that Greece will become nation number ten. And when that tenth nation joins it, you have the entire ancient Roman Empire brought back together the ten toes of Nebuchadnezzar's image in Daniel chapter number two. is to be brought back together at this time of the second coming. And upon his head were ten crowns, and upon his head is the name of blasphemy. Oh, there you have it. That's the Antichrist. And the beast which I saw was like a leopard, and his feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth the mouth of a lion, and a dragon, and the dragon, that's the devil beyond any doubt. There'd be no way in the world uh, to expound verse number two otherwise. And the dragon gave him his power, the devil gave him his seat, and the devil gave him great authority. Now that's the devil given to the Antichrist, described by John as a beast rising up out of the sea of the human family. And John said, I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his dead wound was healed. And all the world wondered after the beast because his deadly wound was healed. Now, to me, you, you, I've heard that verse explained in a lot of ways. But I would be all surprised if verse number three does not refer to the reviving of the Roman Empire. The world and historians look upon ancient Rome as being totally dead. But the world is going to be totally surprised when they discover that Rome never has died. Greece died. Persia died. Babylon died. But Rome never died because of the religious aspect of Rome. It's as strong today as it was when the Caesars reigned, in fact, stronger than when the Caesars reigned 425 A.D. Now that deadly wound that the historians thought had put Rome completely out of business is going to be revived and all the world will wonder after that uh, beast. And they worship the dragon. Watch that. They worship the devil who gave power unto the beast. And they worship the beast also, saying, who is like unto the beast, who is able to make war against him. Uh, do you think it's a coincidence that we have a resurgent of devil worship in our day? When I was a lad, you never heard of a thing like that. You just never heard of it. But in our day, it's a quite common thing to hear of, uh, uh, of Satan worship. And they're actually church buildings that, uh, where they worship Satan. I was over in, in uh, Pittsburgh the other day, and a pastor wanted the building out to me, and he said, Preacher, they just built that in our city, but in that building they worship the devil. I couldn't believe my ears. But he lived there, and I took for granted what he's talking about. In that building they worship the devil. Well, I never heard of a thing like that when I was a lad. But in our day, we have that kind of a situation world around. Now in verse 6, he opened his mouth uh, in blasphemy against God, to blaspheme his name, to blaspheme his temple, and them that dwell in heaven, that's the Father and the Son, and all the saints who have been raptured out. And it was given unto him to make war with the uh, Jewish saints of God, and overcome them. And power is given unto him a wall, kindreds, and tongues, and nations of the earth. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose name is not written in the book of life, of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Now this is a picture of the total captivating power of the Antichrist of the whole world when he comes on the scene. All the world will marvel after the beast and say who is like unto the beast, who is able to make war against the beast. You talk about being a champion. I don't think the world has ever seen a champion like the Antichrist is going to be. MacArthur was a champion. Napoleon was a champion. And we've had many great leaders in military realms in our day and in history. But the world has never encountered such a champion 
as the Antichrist is going to be. He's going to capture the world to the degree that all the world will say, who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war against the beast? Now verse, verse 11. I beheld another beast. This one coming up out of the earth. Now this is not the same as the first beast. The first beast came out of the sea of the human family. This one comes up out of the earth. And he had two horns like a lamb, but he spoke as the devil. Now this is a religious personality. And he emerges in the devil's program. He emerges to the forefront at the same time the first beast comes on the scene. And the second beast is called the false prophet, as we'll see in just a moment. Now the second beast exercises all the power of the first beast, verse 12, before him. To the degree that he causes the earth and them that dwell therein to worship. The second beast causes the world to worship the first beast. Whose dead the womb was healed. Now I want to ask you a question. Who in the world could do that? Verse 12. Who in the world tonight could do that? Religious leader. Where in the world do you have one man so powerful until you cause all the world to worship the first beast whose dead the womb was healed? I couldn't do it. I know of no Baptist that could do that. I know of no Catholic, no uh, National Council of Church leader that could do that. I know of no pagan religious leader that could do that. The only person I know of in the world tonight that could cause all the world to worship the first beast is the Roman Pope. I mean, it just fits. If you have anybody else that fits, come and tell me about it. And I'll consider preaching that. But as far as I know, the only person that fits into the prophecy of verse 12 is the Roman Pope. Now watch what he does in verse 13. This false prophet, the second beast, doeth great wonders. Among them he makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. Now that's a religious miracle. Now that miracle in verse number 13 is done by satanic power. God has nothing to do with verse 13. It's all done by the devil. And by the false prophet, the satanic trinity, the antichrist, the false prophet, and the devil. And God is not in verse number 13 in the least. And yet a miracle, a miracle performed by the second beast. And the second beast, verse 14, deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the first beast. Saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the first beast who had the wound with the sword and didn't live. Now who in the world would fit that? Baptists would not fit that. Baptists don't make images. Methodists would not fit that. Methodists don't make images. Pentecostal people would not fit in verse 14. They don't make images. Now you judge yourself. There's only one group that makes images in the world. 